five, four, three, two, one, zero, and liftoff. You're listening to Working Forward. Presented by Symmetra. In partnership with NASA Reimagine. In this limited podcast series, hosted by Harry Monty, Laura Dynan Haber, Paul Tyler, and Todd Zen, we explore the future of work from a variety of viewpoints and discuss the challenges and opportunities ahead. Hello, everyone, and welcome in to the latest episode of the Working Forward podcast. I'm Todd Zen. I am one of your hosts, and we're so thrilled that you've joined us as we continue to dive into the future of work. We are nearing the end of our series, and we thought it was a great time to bring in two fantastic guests, industry experts, uh, leading research and uh, leading research and consulting firms. We're going to dive in today to the future of workforce benefits. So obviously, it's a topic near and dear to our heart here at Symmetra, and I will bring on our guests in just a few moments. But before I do, I want to introduce my fellow co-hosts starting with Harry Monty, Head of Benefits here at Symmetra. Harry, welcome to the show. Hey, Todd. Looking forward to the conversation today. So I got to ask you, as an executive in the workforce benefits space, uh, I know that this is a topic of great importance to you, and we spend a lot of time thinking about you know, what, what is the future of workforce benefits. What are you excited to dig into with our great guests here today? Yeah, so Todd, as you know, I've spent quite a bit of time with this study already, and there's some really fascinating stuff in here. Um, yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to our discussion about the the wheel of wellness, and in particular, how generational differences impact how people view the different components of it. Um, you know, the the generational impacts that are coming our way as the workforce shifts are just going to be enormously huge uh, in the way that we serve customers. So uh, I think it's going to be a great part of the conversation. Awesome. Well, thank you and welcome. So uh, we are without our friend Paul Tyler today. Unfortunately, he's pulled away on some urgent business, but very pleased to report that we do have Laura Dine and Haber with us. Laura, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Todd. It's so great to be back and I'm looking forward to the conversation and so interested uh, to Harry's point to see where generations play in this wheel and the overall study. So looking forward to, uh, to today's episode. Awesome. Well, without further ado, let me bring in our guests. Uh, we, we today are going to be talking about a really important study. Harry referenced it, really valuable study, uh, the future of workforce benefits. And we're going to dive into it. We've got the two authors and, and leaders of the development of the study. First, let me bring in Chris Morbelli. Uh, he is a partner at Ernst & Young, where he is the America's Life and Group Transformation Practice Leader. Chris, hello. Welcome into the show. Thanks, Todd. Really excited to be here. Appreciate the opportunity to to participate and share some of our uh, exciting research. Excellent. We are thrilled to have you. Uh, And we also have your partner in crime, someone I know who worked very closely with you to bring this to life, Patrick Leary. He is the Corporate Vice President of Workplace Benefit Research at Limra and Loma. Hello, Pat. Welcome into the show. Hey, Todd. Thanks for having me. Look forward to sharing our research with your audience today. Well, we've got a lot of great questions for you guys, but let me hit you with the first one. Pretty high level. I think, Pat, I'll I'll direct this one at you. Um, I know that this was a big undertaking, this study, and you had some lofty objectives. Can you share with our audience just exactly what you were hoping to accomplish with the study and what some of your key objectives were? Sure. Yeah, this study was actually a refresh to a study that EY and Limra partnered on back in 2021. And when the teams got together, you know, we, 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 we stepped back and said, okay, what are, what are the things we really want to learn from this study? Right. And so, um, you know, so we had a series of five questions. One was, what are the next series of unmet needs for employees that can be addressed as white space for growth? 
We also wanted to get a better understanding as to how the workplace distribution landscape uh, was going to change and evolve over the next several years. Uh, related to that, we wanted to get a better understanding of the third party landscape and basically all the players in the ecosystem and, and kind of how roles and responsibilities were, were changing and, and really taking a look at what carriers need to do to remain relevant, to, to really connect effectively into that ecosystem. We also wanted to look at technology, right? So technology is just pervasive in all aspects uh, of our lives today. But we wanted to we wanted to explore what was what would be required of technology to succeed in the in the evolving marketplace, and how would that drive profitable growth? And last but not least, we wanted to take a look at how the different needs. Um, varied by size of firm, by small small employers, mid-size and large. And so back in 2021, we, you know, we published our, our first study where we came up with five megatrends and predictions for growth. And that was done really at the height of the pandemic. So, so a lot of things were happening during that time. So we felt it was a, a good time to go out with a refresh of the study to really understand what's what trends that emerged during the pandemic are sticking, right? And what are perhaps some new trends that are that are emerging based on new dynamics happening in, in the workforce? So I'm going to jump right in and, and uh, build off of that, Pat, right? I'm going to direct this to Chris first, because as I said, I've spent quite a bit of time with the study and um, it, you really identified four key trends across the industry that uh, that you talk about and what the ramifications of those are. Can you just uh, share those four trends with the audience to get them grounded as we go further into the conversation? Yeah, happy to, uh, happy to, Harry. And I mean, let, let me first just say, it really is an exciting time to be in what we believe to be now this new workforce benefits market. You know, and and when when I say that, I the the foundational pillars that we believe have been the bedrock of this industry for decades are just rapidly changing and, and quite frankly, being disrupted as we speak. And as, as EY and Limmer came together to, to, to really understand how, you know, how we can really harness growth and workforce benefits, we were excited to, to present the original research and, and some of our latest research. And, and as you said, Harry, there's, there's four key findings from our, from our research that you know, we were really excited to share with you in the audience today. Number one, you know, for the first time ever, we're in what I would call a generational tipping point. So what does that mean? For the first time, Gen Z and millennial now make up more than 50% of the workforce. And we expect, and the, you know, quite frankly, right from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, expects that to be almost two thirds of the workforce by 2031. So number one, the customer is rapidly changing. Second, you know, as we as we kind of peel back further, we are seeing a continued shift in ways of working, in particular with younger generation now pursuing what I'd call non-traditional work arrangements. Think of that as gig, think of that as freelance labor. And Z and millennial, you know, want to work different. And as uh, we'll go into, I'm sure, in more detail, close to 50% of them, and again, remember, they're 50% of the workforce, are pursuing or you know very interested in pursuing gig or freelance worker over the next five years. So if the worker themselves is changing, what, why, and how benefits are offered uh, will also need to change in order to be able to capture you know this this merging market. Third, you know, and you mentioned before the wheel of wellness, um, uh, you know, we are absolutely continuing to see benefit needs rapidly expanding. But as you said, the generational differences and interests across what we've branded our wheel of wellness, the Limer UI wheel of wellness, which has five dimensions, um, are quite different. And so as employers continue to seek not only how to attract and retain talent for today, but the talent they need in the future, you know, really need to understand needs um, through these lenses to really get the best of the workforce uh, to be part of their, their organization. And then fourth, you know, clearly, as we think about the who and the what changing, how is also going to need to change. And we think technology and data really are going to play uh, uh, an integral role in harnessing growth as benefit offerings continue to expand. And also how each of the generations in our multi-generational workforce want to engage differently. 
So the how is also going to rapidly change. And uh, we're excited to share more about that with uh, each of you today. So I, I want to just kind of dive in a little bit deeper on that one. You mentioned the wheel of wellness. And all I can think of in my head is, is from the glory days of, it's the wheel of fortune. So I hope you have a, a theme song that goes with this wheel of wellness. Um, but you mentioned that, <laughs> try to get that out of your head. Um, but there, you mentioned there's five key dimensions to the wheel. Can you talk to us a little bit more about the wheel? Um, what are those dimensions? How, is, how do they interplay with one another? And what does that look like? Sure, happy to do that. So yeah, now I have I have the the wheel of fortune theme in my <laughs> in my head. Uh, but yeah, because you know when we looked at all the different trends that Chris walked through, and as we were looking at the research that that we did of employers and workers, you know we saw these factors kind of coming together, and these trends re- really demanded a new framework within which to 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 look at at benefits and benefit strategy, right? So as Chris pointed out, we got a multi-generational workforce, there's greater diversity in the workforce, an expanded set of needs, and each of those needs are becoming more and more unique, right? Personalized and customized. There's also more focus in general on holistic wellness of of workers, right? Employers look at that to help attract and and, and retain workers. Uh, and that's what workers, particularly younger workers, they're kind of looking for in that employment relationship. But let's talk about the wheel a little bit. So I want everyone to kind of picture a wheel with different segments in it. So we had, um, you know, as we looked at our data, you know, we said, boy, the, the, the different benefits fall into five different categories. So the first one is physical wellness, right? So you think of benefits like your medical insurance, your dental insurance, your vision insurance, things that help with your physical health and wellness. The second one is mental uh, wellness. So we hear a lot about how, uh, you know, mental wellness needs really rose, right? There was a lot, of, a lot of challenges around that during the pandemic, and that really came to the forefront as as a uh, new, a new and expanded type of benefit. So benefits focus they focus on emotional strength and resilience. Uh, the third one is financial wellness. So this looks at both the insurance as well as the retirement side. So think of your life insurance, your disability, accident, critical illness. This, right, but also your retirement savings plan. So you're like your 401 ks your 403Bs, uh, etc. Uh, another segment uh, fell into the category of professional uh, wellness benefits. Right, so as you think of people's career developments, and this is across the board, right? Uh, we we see a real dynamic shift and change in the skills and higher demands uh, among, you know, for workers in the skills that they need to bring to the plate. So um, different benefits, things like uh, training programs, mentoring, uh, tuition reimbursement programs. So things along those lines are part of the wheel of wellness as well under that professional wellness category. And last but not least is societal wellness, right? So we hear a lot in the in the news about um, workers looking at employers and things like ESG being a consideration, right? But benefits that provide workers the opportunity to do things like volunteer work or gift matching. So those types of benefits are an important segment of the wheel uh, as well. And what we did is, you know, as we asked workers how they would split up those categories if they were given 100 points. And what we found is that there were some interesting differences generationally uh, around that, right? So different, the different generations think of those different categories uh, differently when it comes to what they are looking for in a benefits program for their, uh, you know, from their employer. So I guess kind of continuing the generational themes and uh, something that Harry and Laura brought up, Chris mentioned it in his first remarks as well. I think, Pat, I'll I'll direct this to you. I I really want to dig into the whole idea of a generational tipping point. And we've talked a lot about generational differences on this podcast in lots of different episodes and different contexts. I think it's a a really interesting concept. And I 
you know, I reflect on myself personally, you know, I'm a, I'm a younger Gen Xer and I, uh, you know, I, I remember being in the workforce and, and being young and, you know, I, I don't recall anybody trying to adjust to me, but that that's okay. You know, uh, that, that's just what it was. And and then next thing I know, you know, I'm seeing these reports and all of a sudden the Gen Xers are, are lumped in with the baby boomers and, you know, here comes millennial and Gen Z and it's a, you know, it's a wild ride, but, you know, I guess I'm just interested in your take, you know, how, yeah. how, how is all this going to impact the future? of work we touched on maybe your preferences of wanting to work differently but anything yeah. further on that i think it's a great topic yeah yeah i agree todd and likewise i am a i'm a gen xer myself so a cynical gen xer why are we getting folded in with the baby boomers we're our own unique <laughs> unique group right and when i i remember when i joined the workforce right they, people weren't talking about meeting my holistic wellness needs right it was like get to work show up at eight you're gonna leave it you know when you're done right so very different environment and even from a worker perspective right when we went you know back in the day so this would have been like late late 80s for me um, you know, when you were looking at a benefit package, it was, it was, okay, I need a medical plan. I need, I'd love to have a 401k dental vision, you know, just the basics, but you weren't looking for the expanded wellness benefit categories and some of the societal benefits that we talk about, uh, talk about now. But, you know, there's a couple of things when you talk about generational differences, Chris touched on this, um, with, you know, when you look at the makeup of the workforce, so right now, about half of the workforce is the that Gen Z and millennial group, so that younger workforce. And according to the Bureau of Labor Stats, by 2031, that cohort is going to be more well over 60% of the workforce, right? So think of how they're going to shift, right? And so they move, what I like to say is they're moving into the sweet spot of having those needs that, um, that our industry provides the products and services around, right? Those different segments of the wheel of wellness around, you know, mental health, physical health and, and, and wellness, the financial protection with of life insurance and you know, accident, critical illness, all the, all the disability, all those great benefits um, that we provide, right? So while they're moving into that sweet spot, at the same time, how they view benefits, how they want to learn about benefits, how they want to enroll in benefits, how they want to utilize the, their benefits is different than older workers, right? We always, Chris and I always like to say that, you know, benefit programs today are designed for Gen X and baby boomer generations. And we really need to shift that focus because, you know, the, the younger generations, they, they're more digital natives, right? So they're, they're all about digital. So technology becomes uh, really critical as part of the, the, the equation when it comes to you know, uh, education and communication and enrollment uh, around benefits, but how they view work itself is different. Like we've we've talked about, it's it's not just about the cash comp and some basic benefits. It's a more holistic view of um, of an employer and what they can they can provide to a young worker. So that's where that wheel of wellness comes into play, right? So a young worker can kind of go to an employer, a potential employer, and say, "Hey, yeah, this you know this this employer is looking out for my holistic wellness. They're not just giving me a paycheck here." And so we know younger workers are are more focused on and, and value those types of attri attributes, um, you know, from, from a potential employer. But another really important thing, and Chris touched on this, was the growing gig economy and freelance work, right? So more and more, according to our analysis, we're, we're seeing that type of work gaining momentum, right? It accelerated in the pandemic and our research shows that that's only going to grow, right? And it's particularly among that younger workforce. So, you know, right now, it, I think, Chris, you, you had mentioned this, you know, 50% of the workforce is currently in that, that millennial and Gen Z category. 50% of that workforce participate in the gig economy to at least some extent. So either part-time as a side gig on top of a full-time job or as their primary source of, of employment, right? It's the primary source of, of, of pay. Or, um, so it raises the question, 
how how and who are, are it's going to be there to address their insurance, retirement, and related uh, planning needs, right? So that's a it's a it's a real it's a real opportunity for organizations in the benefit space as well as those in the retail space and the digital space to connect in with them. So a lot of a lot of things happening with this generational shift as the millennials and um, Gen Z again move into that sweet spot. Uh, target market for our, our industry's products and services. And I would just I would just add, Pat, I think, you know, as remote work becomes more and more hybrid hybrid, right? The definition of the workplace is fundamentally changing. And as you think about more and more workers moving to non-traditional employment relationships or, or arrangements, the definition of the employee is actually changing. Right. And so that's why we fundamentally believe this is a workforce benefits business in the future. And as you think yeah. about it, you just play out some of what Pat talked about with, you know, this drive to kind of alternate work arrangements, product definition, product eligibility, distribution channel, reach, ways of engagement, ways of educating, completely change. So, you know, as we talk again, as I opened about some of the fundamentals of this employee benefits and workplace benefits business, we're primed for this really, really yeah. incredibly exciting workforce benefits. Yeah. Hey, Chris. We- Chris, one of the things that you were talking there reminded me, what's the stat on payroll deduction? I think that's a, a kind of an eye opener when, you know, we talk about payroll deduction and uh, well, I'm, I'm going to save that for later in the podcast. You're going to save that. All right. Yes. So, <laughs> it's oh, coming up building, later. Stay he's tuned. building the suspense. <laughs> building the suspense. So, yeah, I mean, one of the things that I, uh, one of the reasons I'm excited about this particular episode is that as we look at your study, so many of the things that are in there are things that we've talked about extensively in this podcast series, right? From um, the generational differences to technology, to remote work, to gig, to mental health. And so to see that wheel and how the different generations are uh, are viewing the, these things was fascinating to me, right? So as you look at um, mental health is a great example. Um, the, you know, from going from the older workers, older generations to the younger generations, um, the increase in attention to mental health related benefits is astounding. And so it really is, it underscores how flexible employers are going to have to be to meet the different generational needs uh, over the next several years as that shift continues. And, and how technology needs to evolve to kind of bring together this holistic, connected, much more personalized experience. Because if there's one thing that we guarantee as part of our research, that wheel of wellness will continue to evolve. Right? And so, and products and services will continue to expand. So getting ahead of that, really thinking about that. I always, it's always a quote that when we talk to a broker, I remember it'll always stay in my mind. You know, the, the carrier carriers or the, the, the entity that can maintain pace in an unprecedented pace of change is going to be the leader of the future. Just think about that. Maintaining pace in an unprecedented pace of change is going to be the leader. Like so, uh, yeah. a lot to unwrap, unwrap with that type of statement. Yeah. I, I love that. I think it's at the core of our, our research. Yeah, and Harry, I just want to follow up on something you said that I, th- I think is important here, where y- you highlighted uh, the 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 mental wellness segment of the wheel, right? And so, as I was talking earlier about how this this generations, they're going to carry that forward, right? So mm-hmm. older generations, there's a resistance or a hesitancy to to tell their employer that hey I have this need or I want to reach out can you connect me right and where younger generations they're much more open about that so we you know as the, these younger generations the the younger millennials and Gen Zs, as they become older and as some of these other needs start to emerge, they're still looking at it through the, the holistic lens there of, you know, which would include emotional and mental wellness needs. So carriers really need and others really need to be sensitized to the fact that that, that view is going to carry forward and to be successful in the future, you got to be thinking about the different segments of the wheel. Yeah. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to come back to tech and data and digitalization for a second. Right. Because, Chris, you just brought it up as being critically important. And that's talked a lot about in your study about the fact that 
digitalization to meet the needs of different generations is going to be important to maximizing the benefits uh, that, that they have available to them. And um, as I said, that's come up several times here. In fact, in a previous episode, we had a um, HR leader from, from a company state the fact that if it wasn't online, she wouldn't do it. Right. And so that that's telling. Um, and I know I'll go all the way back to our very first episode when we were talking to a futurist about really big macro trends. One of the things we talked about was the fact that consumer expectations in your day to day life outside of work are the expectations that your employees are going to have. Right. Those are the experiences that they expect. It's going to bleed into how they want to engage with their with their employers. So, um, I mean, it's such a big topic, but Chris, I'm just curious, you know, you want to say a little bit more about uh, w- why the study indicated that di- digitalization is going to be so important going forward? Yeah, no, I, uh, th- thank you. I mean, great, great question. I mean, as we, as we, as the workforce continues to diversify and this kind of generational tipping point continues to take shape, you know, our research shows, you know, as we just think about younger generations and I, I guess we're all, sharing. I'm Gen X as well. So, uh, 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 you know, as we think about younger generation, how they want to work, what they want to buy, and how they want to engage is different. And so, uh, and as we think about the role technology play, places or uh, plays in kind of this, you know, personalized way of engaging, um, uh, it's going to be critical. And so, I mean, and we can look at it through both a consumer and an employer lens. And we did look at both through the research, which we found fascinating. And so from a consumer, you know, a worker perspective, you know, when we asked about, about value and interest relative to digital capabilities, you know, really old generations value digital capabilities in the key moments that matter. Things like online claims, online enrollment. But as we started peeling back the research further and really looking through the full life cycle of engagement, you know, we saw some interesting deltas when we compared a Z to a boomer and kind of, you know, uh, millennial and, and uh, X between that I think we all just need to consider as, as leaders within this exciting and fantastic industry as we consider the future of benefits delivery. And so, uh, you know, just a few fun facts and uh, I'll come back to the uh, comment that uh, uh, Pat made a few minutes ago. But we look at Zs and we think about what their kind of needs are across the, the wheel of wellness and the different dimensions. They're almost twice as reliant on their employer in terms of benefits guidance. So twice compared to Boomer as reliant. Uh, they're, all, they're actually three times more likely to engage if it's done through a mobile app versus kind of a traditional mobile responsive website, which is much more the favored by, by Boomer. But what Pat said, which, you know, I found interesting, you know, being someone who's been in the industry for 25 years and did some work in billing and early in my my career, Zs are actually almost half, half as interested in payroll deduction as a mechanism for premium collection, which, you know, candidly has been the tried and true mechanism for premium collection and persistency and retention for years. Set it, forget it. Um, uh, especially as we see the continued shift to voluntary. They're only half as interested. And I always like to tell the story. Recently had a, a, um, a, an event in my backyard, uh, fellow EY colleagues and my uh, nine-year-old daughter, the future enterpriser that she was, she set up a, uh, you know, a, a table to sell co- cookies and uh, 99% of the money that she made that day was through Venmo, right, through digital means. So as we think about money in, money out, right, we've got to think about things in terms of digital payments, right? certainly on the way out as we think about claim payment, but perhaps also as the research is showing us, and we'll continue to research it, perhaps even on money in. Um, So like the very fundamentals, you know, are are just the expectations are different. Uh, And then from an employer lens, you know, your point about you spoke with an HR leader and online is the way to go. 70% of employers across all size segments, whether it's small, whether it's large, stated that digital capabilities will play a much higher role in carrier selection in five years. And to further test that, we actually made employers that we surveyed declare 50% of employers would change carriers if they did not seamlessly connect with their benefits technology. Connectivity matters. So as customer segments continue to evolve, products and services continue to expand, Technology's ability to stitch together the broader ecosystem, leverage data, AI for personalization uh, are going to be key to align consumer preference with benefit delivery to maximize participation and maximize value realized. 
I think it's it's fascinating in a number of ways. Um, so I'm a millennial. Welcome to the party. And it's it's interesting because I remember when I was, I, I wouldn't say first entering the workforce, but towards the beginning few years of my career, it was always, you know, we need to plan for the millennials. The millennials are coming. Like we're just like this force of nature and, and maybe we still are and that's great. Um, but I find it very interesting, especially with disease and and the younger generations, you know, making us millennials feel like we're of the dinosaur times. Um, it, it, it's interesting to me, and I'll be curious to see where we are in five to seven years. You make the Venmo comment, right? It's talking about how do they prefer to pay money in, money out. I wonder where we're going to be at that point, right, with intention. And what do we have not even thought about? Um, instead of, you know, payroll deduction, now it's, you know, Venmo or whichever one you prefer on your phone. Are we going to get to a point where it's just part of who we who we are, right? Is it is it built into the cost of an employee so the employee doesn't see the money going out of the paycheck, but instead of the employer paying the employee, let's say, $100,000 a year, and their benefits of making all of this up are worth $25,000 a year, maybe it's just seventy five. dollars the employee takes it home, they don't see the difference, and maybe that's how it's sold. I don't know. But it's interesting to me um, to think about how different minds are going to view this and the wheel and the research around the wheel was was very fascinating to see how the different generations value the different pieces. And I'll be curious to see how the evolution of that continues. And if we ever get into a model where people are only opting into pieces of it and they get to take all of their eggs and instead of their eggs being put around the five pieces of the wheel, what if I want all of my eggs in these two baskets and I don't want any of my eggs in these three baskets? And do I have that opportunity as an employee to let my employer know, please you know, uh, invest more on my behalf for the services here? I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, just get, you know, the, what you're talking about there, Laura, is just really what we hear over and over again is this move towards customization, personalization, the customer experience, right? And now it's moved into the worker experience, the employee experience. Let me pick and choose what benefits I need because as we talked about, there are just so many different types of benefits out there. It's just hard to, to get your arms around it. So good point. And, and I would just say, like, what, what I find fascinating for the podcast listeners, you know, uh, you know, in the research, we created this heat map of products and services and interest and value by generation. And, and when you look at it through Z, Millennial X and Boomer, you see some commonality. But you see a lot of differences. And, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, as an example, we've been taught, we've mentioned mental health a few times. I mean, as a Z, there is equal interest and value for Z on mental health benefits or services as their vision plan and almost as much as dental and medical. That was surprising. You know, um, uh, from a career development services and, you know, Laura and your fellow millennials, you know, you are here and you are, you are, your voice is being heard. Like that was one of the hot spots of the millennial uh, kind of generation. So you think about professional development. And, you know, you know, a lot of times we get questioned like, well, as people all age, won't they just naturally take on the cohort or the pattern of the next cohort? And Pat and I and the researchers, we don't believe that because what we think is benefit, need and value will stick. So what will happen is it'll be a hybrid of the two. There's certain things that are very much life stage based, perhaps tuition assistance as an example. But things like mental health services, we fundamentally believe will stick and move more to the right. And the older generation will take on the pattern of a hybrid of the younger generation. And so uh, it's just really, really fascinating. And if we kind of go even further into the future, and we think about these needs drastically changing so much, and if we really want to fundamentally reframe how benefits are delivered, can can we get to a model? Can we evolve to a model from a product, from an uh, underwriting, from an eligibility to like, actually have subscriptions where people can actually change what they're offered, what they what they have as they move through life. I mean, talk about a relationship with a customer for life with a leader like Symmetra. I mean, the, the, the possibilities are really endless, but the foundation is completely changed with how we talk about benefits and how we price, build, deliver benefits from today. But we're certainly going to see as we go forward. Topic, you know, the use of data and analytics to really create those experiences and be able to create this benefit model of the future. It's just going to be central to that, right? The power of data and analytics. 
Yeah, and, and so, I want to stay. Oh, oh I was going to say I want to stay on the uh, the future. So just talking about, um, you know, there's been significant change in the recent years, as we've all noted thus far, and through the change, you know, it's it's positioned for continued growth as your as your results show. But wanted to just ask, you know, Chris, let's start with you. Can you summarize some of the recommendations for harnessing this growth? Because although it may be read as tumultuous, there's still a lot of excitement to that. So so what does that look like? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, you know, clearly, you know, this unprecedented pandemic, in our view, has had a significant impact in the benefits landscape. Um, but, but there's been some real, you know, uh, tailwinds for the benefits industry as as a result. And, um, you know, we we definitely are excited about the future. And just, you know, a few points around harnessing growth. I mean, as I said earlier, in terms of workplace. You know, remote work's here to stay. Hybrid work models are becoming more mainstream. So again, the workplace is changing. Um, in terms of workforce, you know, we're seeing this kind of shift around traditional employment models to non-traditional. So the workforce is changing. You know, benefit, interest, and value. So when we actually trended, and you know, three data points make a trend, but we, we have two, and we'll continue to uh, you know research together. But we look at the original 2021 uh, data points, and we see kind of this heightened value placement on benefits and interest. You know, sometimes we say this most, some of the most fascinating things about research is not what has changed, but what hasn't changed. We actually saw that benefit, interest, and value placement stick. You know, so as we think about benefit needs and interests continuing to be heightened, um, uh, but we also see this very, very differential value placement by generation, by wheel of wellness dimension. Um, and we see this kind of benefit interest, you know, as we've talked about continuing to stick on the go forward and these expanded products and services continuing to be valued. Um, and, you know, we believe, you know, again, the winners of the future are those that are really going to drive ease, personalization, quality of experience, connected experience. And those that are widely recognized, we firmly believe will drive top, co- top quartile performance and leadership position. And again, back to that quote, you know, whoever can maintain pace in an unprecedented pace of change will be the winner. And the value is there. The, you know, the market is growing, you know, and, and just on a side note from a, what we saw from an employer perspective, interest change from um, uh, 2021 to 2023, we actually saw a double digit. I mean, 10, 12, 15, 26% interest increases biggest driver of that was small employers. So if you think about small employers, less than 100 lives, what were they thinking about in the pandemic? Survival. You know, now they're saying, hey, you know, we need to also invest into these benefit plans to attract and retain the talent we need today and the talent we need to tomorrow. So when we think about small, middle, large market, really prime, these benefit uh, um, packages expand, expanding, if we can drive a much easier experience together in industry, the growth is truly there to harness. Yep. Uh, Pat, any other thoughts? No, I, th- I think I think you captured it uh, pretty well there, Chris. And I think I, you know one of the things that that I would add is you know like, like you know during the the discussion so far, we've been talking about all this dynamic change happening in the workplace, remote work, gig economy, all this. We had a series of questions in in our employer study about like looking five years out. Like in five years, you know, what's go- what's going to be important to attract and retain employees? One of the key takeaways, one of the things we heard over and over again is that benefits remain central to this. So just echoing some of the, you know, the information that that, that Chris share, shared, even looking forward, employers with all this dynamic change, new generations, dynamic workforce, benefits are going to be central to attract and retain the best workers. Yeah, that that's a really important message, I think. And I I want to follow up on uh, something that came up, both Pat and Chris in your comments, and I think Harry and Laura both referenced it. I can tell you it's come up in just about all of our episodes as well, and that really is the future of remote and hybrid work. And you know, Chris, you mentioned you think it's here to stay, and I I think that's a prevailing opinion. Um, but I I struggle with this a little bit. Um, you know, as I was preparing for this episode, uh, I stumbled on an article, and it was essentially why remote work is here to stay, and it it listed all the reasons you'd expect, right? Like employee experience, preferences, flexibility, talent recruitment, being able to 
uh, recruit from a bigger geographic pool. And I thought, all right, well, you know, that makes sense to me. Um, but then the very next day, there was a major insurer here in the Harford area that said, no, nope, you know, actually we're, we're, we're enforcing some back to work here. Um, and, you know, part time in some cases, full time in other cases. And I thought the article announcing was really interesting. There was a lot of talk of, you know, a strong preference among senior managers of getting people back in the office. There was also some political elements. You know, the mayor commented like, yeah, we got to get people back to the office and start filling the coffee shops and the restaurants and the things like that. So there's a lot of push and pull here, right? Um, so I guess I'm just interested in both your opinions, right? Um, you know, I, I suspect it's here to stay, but then sometimes I doubt it a little bit, right? Like, are we going to get pulled into the past or are we really going to keep forging this new path into hybrid and possibly full remote? Have Todd, have you had Elon Musk as one of your guests? We know how, <laughs> for those who know, like he is not a fan of remote work, as we all know, right? With Tesla. He's, he's, he's on the wait list. Uh, we're not sure if uh... <laughs> you're he's waiting for the to, callback. He, he's yeah. asked us several times to be on. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, but. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So maybe I can add some comments to that. Yeah, I, I don't think we're ever going to go back, right, to where it's nine to five. I, I know talking here at, at Limra to so, some of the folks, we, we talk about, you know, different work environments and, oh, remember the days there used to be a factory whistle and we'd all bring, you know, lunch, people, lunch pails you see in the old movies, the black and white movies. We're never going to go back to that. I think we're going to go back, you know, it's, employers are kind of settling on this hybrid approach. To your, to your point, Todd, you hear announcements all the time about uh, different organizations getting their workers, asking workers to come back, you know, a few days a week. I haven't seen any, again, putting the Elon Musks aside, um, I haven't really seen like broad-based demand to br say, okay, workers, you definitely have to come back five days a week. I think Amazon did was talked about that for a while. Uh, but this, I think organizations are going to be settling on this hybrid approach where, you know, a few days in, uh, in the office and a few days to work re remotely. And, and, you know, some of the things that I've heard, it, it, it's part of it's the type of work that you're doing, right? And when, it, when you're in knowledge-based uh, ty types of employment and types of jobs, that's where it really suffers when you're remote, right? There are other types of, you know, blue collar industries, right? If you work in the trades, well, it's hard, hard to be a plumber working from home, right? So, so that's another lens we have to think about is the type of work um, that's being done. Um, but I, I don't think we're going back. Another thing that I think is going to play uh, a, a role here, and I'll be curious, uh, as, as we all know, we haven't really talked about the economic environment too much. But to your point, Todd, you hear that a lot of CEOs will whisper and say, yeah, we really would love to get people back, but it's such a hot labor market. If we do that, they're just going to jump to another employer who, who allows them to work remotely. I think it'll be really interesting if you know, and we all know this will happen at some point, whether it's next year, two years, five years from now, the pendulum's going to swing, right? And and, and it, it's no longer going to be a workers, a hot labor market. And then, okay, are employers going to say, okay, guys, I'm in control now. I want people coming back to work, right? Coming back to the office. Um, so I think that's still an open question. I still don't think it'll all say, okay, well, we can do it now and everybody's five days a week. Uh, but if that, some of those employment trends start to shift a little bit, I think you know, we might see more of it. So Chris, I don't know what, what, whether you agree with that or your thoughts. We may need another podcast for this topic itself. Right? Yeah, yeah, uh, right. Um, you know, I, I have a lot of perspective on it. I, mean, I think I think you hit a few points of, look, it's not a one-size-fits-all. We shouldn't try to make it one. I mean, it's all going to be about the different type of worker. It is going to be around the, econo you know, the economic environment. Uh, you know, we've seen a lot of, you know, in the insurance space alone, the insurance sector, you know, we've seen people hiring people remote, you know, as a competitive advantage and, and a way to recruit talent. I found the data and the research interesting in that in 2021, you know, kind of in the tail, but, you know, still the height of the pandemic. 79% of employers cited they were in some kind of hybrid work arrangement. Um, uh, in 2023, two years later, where you know we would kind of 
declared today to be post-pandemic, even those recent challenges with COVID. Um, 84% said they were in some kind of hybrid. <laughs> so you, you think about surprises that you would have thought somewhat of a regression. It actually went the other way. You know, um, uh, and, uh, you know, again, a data point that I think will be really important. I, I do think, you know, as I as I look across the industry and I have these co- conversations and dialogues with executives and clients, I do think we probably need to reposition the problem statement a little bit. Like there's a ton of focus on return to work, return to work, return to office, return to office. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why that makes a lot of sense in terms of community and collaboration, and engagement. You know, not not to plug EY, but like just as a commercial, like we made it really about return to togetherness, you know, return to togetherness and like really about getting people back to being with people. And that really uh, worked really, really well, as opposed to return to office, like return to office is a location, return to togetherness is an experience. So, you know, I think, um, you know, I just think uh, I do think we're I think hybrids here to stay. Um uh, you know, I, I um, think it's uh, there's a definite opportunity based on segmentation of job type. Uh, I think there's an element of togetherness and and really understanding the value of that. And uh, and I think there's like I was talking to a client the other day. There's a health aspect to it, just moving around more and being more you know mobile. And think about that from a benefits perspective. <laughs> you know, I know what I did for two years sitting at home in my office. You know, it's not wasn't most maybe the most active lifestyle versus being more, you know, in the office as I am today and, you know, commuting with my, you know, commuting with my, my colleagues. So I know that we're reaching uh, pretty much the end of our time together. Uh, so I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to raise this topic because we'd be remiss not to, and that is artificial intelligence, right? It, it, can you have a conversation today without talking about artificial intelligence? And Laura, I promise I'm not going to bring up the metaverse. But oops, I just did. No, I, I actually want so, I want you to. Okay. Um, but you know, just real quickly, I'm curious for your take on how artificial intelligence is going to play not only in the benefits landscape that we've been talking about, but just more broadly, if you have opinions about artificial intelligence in the workplace, how it's going to change the future of work, and um, you know, people are worried about some of the unintended negative aspect of it too. So, any comments you have on artificial intelligence, I'd love to hear. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So two parts to your question there, Harry. First on the on the benefits impact. I think in and the other thing, or before I get start go on get on my soapbox here, like when you talk about artificial intelligence, there's different components of, and types of artificial intelligence. Where I think in the benefit space where artificial artificial intelligence will really could be a game changer is around education and enrollment, right? As we're seeing things like chat GPT, right? So that is just, oh my gosh, that is a real game changer. And we we hear a lot about companies like putting together these SWAT teams and these task forces to say, how do we let leverage this generative AI and conversational AI to help workers better learn about, understand, prioritize, um, you know, the, their benefits selection. So I think, you know, it can be a real game changer because that's always been a tough nut to crack, right, in, in our industry is getting uh, workers up to speed on what benefits they have and getting them to understand their needs and what benefits that that most effectively can address uh, those needs. Um, as far as broader artificial intelligence, I think everything that I've heard and, and that I've I've read is that, it's, it's going to help employees and workers be more productive and help them be better at their job. The one thing I hear is that, um, that, that, you know, with, with, again, with using it to help them be better, uh, with their job and less about replacing, um, yeah, you know, their role, right? One thing that I do, do here, I lost my train of thought there for a second, but creativity was is the one thing where we're not there yet with artificial intelligence. So those, those roles that kind of have that creativity element to it, they're not as threatened as much, but we, it, everything that I've seen, it's about enhancing and helping. Um, but one thing I, I, um, 
you think about and you hear about different types of artificial intelligence replacing jobs. And one of the industries I think it's really interesting is the trucking industry. So using artificial and uh, artificial intelligence to replace long haul truckers and truck drivers. So there's a whole segment of the workforce that they're saying in 10 years could be you know, displaced by this. And it's not just uh, the truckers themselves. It kind of gets to your earlier point, Todd, about, um, you know, the, the, the insurance carrier in the Hartford area or the mayor coming out saying, wait, we got to get people in the shops. These truck drivers going cross country, you know, they're stopping at diners and rest stops. So it has this ripple effect, right? If a truck's being driven by artificial intelligence, it's not looking for a good diner somewhere, <laughs> you know, on its route, right? So there, I think there, there is a, a threat, but looking holistically and, and more broad, technology has always displaced workers over time. And the and the question is, can they be upskilled, retrained, repositioned in some way? But that's those are some thoughts around technology and AI. So, thank you. Yeah, I, I you know, I'll I'll take us I'll t- try to take a step back again as I think about all of the conversations we've talked about today. You know, let's put AI aside for a second. I mean, I think everyone hopefully would overwhelmingly agree data is going to be key in the future. And, you know, as we think about like, you know, for years and years and years, you know, the conversation was about customer segments, small, middle, large. And now we're talking about generational differences. And we're potentially talking about gig, non-gig. And we're talking about, you know, you know, geo and, you know, gender and race and household and income. I mean, data is going to be the key. And that is one of the true, truly competitive, dis- kind of competitive advantages insurance carrier can, can, can create. Um, and I look at AI as a mechanism of like, how do we interpret that data and, and create insight? Um, you know, the other point I would just make, and, and again, I hope, hope all your listeners, you know, you each, if there's one thing that I, I felt incredibly proud of through the pandemic, this is a noble industry. Like, this is a noble industry. You know, I think about, you know, how we as a, as a, as a society kind of, you know, survived the pandemic insurance and what we were able to do in terms of protection it, it has got to be up there in the conversation. And, and as I think about, you know, all of the data and all of the research we do, human in the loop is always at the center of everything we find. And so, you know, how do we really move from these, you know, you know, these kind of prior legacy experiences where we're driving transactions to really the future where we want our talent to be driving experiences uh, and true customer care and protection and, you know, health and return to work, especially as we think about these, all these dimensions, this is no longer just physical, it's physical, it's mental, it's financial, like that creativity, that advice, that, that kind of value proposition, that's how AI is going to help us to care for our clients better and, and be really an enabler for people to truly deliver on the noble purpose uh, that insurance is and, and the benefits industry in my view. Well, I can't think of a better note to end on. I think that was uh, fantastic. Uh, Pat and Chris, we, we really can't thank you enough for being here. This, this was a really fun conversation, perfectly on theme for our podcast. So thank you. I would encourage our audience to seek out this report, uh, the Future of Workforce Benefits Study. It's available on the EY website, some key data points and summaries. It's, it's really compelling stuff. Uh, so thank you both for coming on and being fantastic guests. Thank you for having us. Thanks, guys. Happy to be here. And with that, we're going to wrap up this episode of the Working Forward podcast. Thanks to Harry and Laura, as well as you, the audience. Uh, As I mentioned earlier, we're nearing the end here, but we're not quite done. We'll be back with one more episode with the hosts. We're going to be wrapping up some key insights from our experience and bit of a teaser trailer here. Uh, We'll also be announcing the future of the Working Forward podcast. We we might not be done just yet. Um, So anyway, thank you again to Pat and Chris. Thank you for listening. And we will see you again soon on the Working Forward podcast. You're listening to Working Forward, Future of Work podcast series.
The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the hosts and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Symmetra Life Insurance Company or its affiliates. The host is not affiliated with Symmetra Life Insurance Company and or any of its affiliates and is solely responsible for the content.